Well, growth with macro prudence, that's been the mantra so far, and it's unlikely that it will change. Uh, for more on that, I'm in conversation with Samiran Chakrabarti, Chief Economist, Citibank India. Uh, Samiran, thank you so very much for taking time out for us. It's a pleasure to finally have you with us here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Samiran, to begin, I do want to understand that, you know, we've been talking about policy continuity, but maybe with a little bit of tweak here and there. Also, given the mandate that we saw in terms of numbers yesterday, uh, in the upcoming budget, uh, would you expect the government's thrust to change a little bit, uh, maybe more focused spending on rural? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Will we also see slightly more populist spending? How are you looking at it that, at this point? So first, we have to understand the context of the uh, budget mass also. Uh, the big context is that the government has got uh, much larger than expected RBI dividend. Uh, the fiscal deficit for FY24, the year gone by, is now 5.6% rather than the 5.8% that people thought before. So in that sense, meeting the interim budget's target of 5.1% of GDP fiscal deficit doesn't look to be a very difficult task for the government. In fact, even after meeting that target, they might have some fiscal space to do a bit of so-called populist spending. Uh, in fact, we don't expect them to cut back on the capex spending that they had announced in the interim budget. Uh, so for this year, this is not that big a problem. Both can continue. Uh, the, if at all, what markets would want to get want more clarity on is uh, the fiscal glide paths that the government had uh, projected, whether the government wants to stick to that sort of a fiscal glide path or wants to calibrate this in any way. That's something which on the budget day would probably be a more bigger discussion point than just the FY25 number. Okay, all right. Uh, and uh, Samiran, I do want to understand, you know, we have been talking about a lot that's going right for the Indian economy, but at the same time, uh, possibly sort of the trickle-down effect the government would have hoped for, uh, not particularly playing out there. Uh, do you think that that is the case and do you think there is need for more concerted uh, measures there in terms of maybe employment generation uh, or uh, inequality? So one thing we have to understand is that how politically the BJP would look at these election results. Uh, if you look at how the distribution of BJP's losses in seats have been. That's entirely concentrated in just four states. Uh, and it is not a pan-India discontent that they're facing or there is any sign of pan-India distress. Uh, if that was the case, then BJP wouldn't have won in two additional states uh, legislative assemblies. So if that's the assessment, then there is no need for a large scale tweaking of the economic model that they have been following. Uh, yes, uh, you could always argue that the focus of the government has been a lot more on the supply side reforms. Maybe at this juncture, they have to do a bit more demand side. And it, when it comes to that demand side, yes, employment generation could be one of the things. We have to understand that the government has taken 250 million people out of poverty in the last 10 years. Now this cohort has to be taken to the next level. And in our view, that can happen with the right combination of skill development and access to credit. Uh, that would make these people move to that next level, which would create demand and we would have a more balanced growth model. So we are not necessarily suggesting a model of just inducing more cash subsidies, but more of employment generation through skill development and credit access for the bottom of the pyramid. 
Right, so uh, the fiscal deficit target, at least for the ongoing fiscal, unlikely to see much of a change. Uh, India's growth potential more or less in, uh, intact. But uh, I do want to understand how you're viewing uh, the issue of maybe slightly longer term reforms, especially the more challenging ones. Uh, do, you, do you think those will be harder to implement? Um, what about the labor codes, uh, you know, might be slightly more low hanging fruit in comparison. But how are you viewing reforms at this juncture. Uh, what is the outlook on that front and what is the impact thereon? Uh, so, yes, there are uh, bigger structural reforms that uh, this particular uh, NDA government has tried in the past without that much success. Uh, so there was an anticipation in the market that if uh, NDA gets a larger majority, then some of these things could be uh, prioritized. Now, obviously, the priority now would be to establish the cohesion and credibility of the new coalition. And to do that, you cannot take uh, jump into contentious reforms which could throw out winners and losers in the society. Uh, any uh, change often creates dissonance of its own. So I suspect that these things could be uh, deferred a little, not because the government does not have numbers. Uh, most of these reforms can be done through simple majority in the parliament, which the government will likely possess. And some of them, like the one that you mentioned about uh, implementation of the labor laws, is more of an executive action rather than legislation. Legislation has already been passed. So, uh, so it's not a question of the ability to do so, it's more the willingness to do so that might for the time being uh, not being in place. We don't think that this is at this moment affecting our macro forecast, whether it's growth or inflation in any meaningful way. Uh, yes, if they are done, then probably there is upside surprise possible on India's potential growth estimates. Uh, but for now, that seven to eight percent kind of growth uh, could be maintained even if uh, these structural reforms get deferred a bit. All right, Samiran, uh, one quick question regarding the upcoming RBI policy before I can let you go. Uh, while the expectation is, of course, of a status quo, uh, do you possibly expect a change in stance, though that too uh, appears unlikely? Also, going forward, can we finally expect some easing in liquidity conditions? Uh, any other expectations from the policy on Friday? Look, we have to understand again the context here. The context is that there's been a new variable that has got into play, which is uh, a bit of political uncertainty and policy uncertainty. Uh, that has created some volatility in all asset classes. Uh, in that sort of a backdrop, I don't think uh, the RPI would be keen to uh, provide more uh, impetus to that volatility by changing things around. So this is a time to uh, keep things under check, uh, to provide confidence to the markets that the RBI will keep things very orderly in, in conditions in place. So I suspect that in this uh, June 7th policy, it's going to be no change on not only the rates, but also on the policy stance. There are anyway, not just domestic uncertainty, but enough global uncertainty as well. On the liquidity question, the RPI has now been managing liquidity in a way that the overnight rate is closer to the repo rate rather than closer to the MSF rate. Uh, that policy will continue. Uh, in fact, what is going to be interesting to see is that once the new government is in place, the backlog of spending, which was not done over the last two, three months, and the government is sitting on this huge surplus provided by the RBI, when that money gets spent, whether liquidity will improve too much, forcing RBI to calibrate liquidity right. in a way that 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 it that the overnight rate comes down to uh, six and a half again. All right. Thank you so much, Samiran, for taking time out for us. And we do hope to have you back again with us soon.